we were discussing a variety of manifolds which were made by operations, product, quotient, and surgery, starting from building blocks. And there is one more example that I would like to discuss, which we'll use. And that is this funny example. As usual, let's take a square and then thinking of it as a, an elastic sheet or piece of paper, let's ask ourselves what happens if I identify this edge and this edge like so, up and down, and this edge and this edge in the opposite direction as well. I'd like to remind you that if we had the same direction here and here, you get a manifold called Klein bottle. Yeah. And if we had the same direction here and same direction here, you get the torus. But now we have the opposite direction vertically and opposite direction horizontally also. So what is this object? Now, this object is difficult to visualize. So let us try to figure out what this looks like by calculating with the pictures. Here is how we shall calculate. We start from this, keeping track of how the identifications go, and I cut it along this curve. I cut the whole thing along this curve. Naturally, after I cut it, at the end I have to glue them back together. Otherwise, it's not going to be the same thing. But when I cut it, I get two pieces as a result. Ooh, it's very, wow, that, they're falling apart for some reason. This piece and this piece. Yeah. And let's keep marking the identification arrows like this. At the end, as we say, we have to identify, glue back together the cuts. So let's keep track of them by putting in those marks. Do you understand why I put them in the same direction? Because they must be glued together, not the other way around. Yeah. OK. Now, the top piece is not difficult to see what it is. I'll keep using yellow if you like. Oops. Like that, and like that. Let's focus on the vertical edges. Not worrying at the moment about the horizontal ones, but as far as the vertical edges are concerned, you can see what happens. You can take these, twist, and glue. It's just a movie strip. Can you draw pictures as fast as I am drawing? <laughs> Difficult, huh? But that's how. Oh, wait a minute. So, having bragged about this, I think it should probably look like this. And then it should look like this. It should look like this. And that piece came like that. And because I twist it upside down, it looks like that. And then this comes in like that. This comes in like that. And then this is like this, and this is like this. Okay. So if I glue them together, identify the vertical strips, I get the standard movie strip. So far, so good. And then you get this in the back, you get this in front, and somewhere in the middle, um, there is uh, an interesting that that thing that happens. Um, so this is that, but this is this. So in the middle, those marks exchange places. What about the bottom? The bottom piece is also easy to visualize. Because we're doing topology, this half of this, I can stretch it and make it into a full disk. So this point and this point, those corners became those two points. But the rest is the same. 
topologically the same thing as the semi disk. So, what we are doing, what we have to do is the following operation. You see, there is a disk, disk whose boundary consists of a single circle. Single circle which is marked by this solid arrow followed by this sort of rounded arrow. If you look at the Möbius strip, we know that its boundary is also a single circle. And if you go along the boundary, you get this solid arrow followed by the round arrow. So it's exactly the same boundary. What we have to do then is to glue this to this piece along the boundaries, along common boundaries. Thus, what we have, excuse me. Yes, some people are. Uh, Ah, okay, so you drop the pen, okay. Sometimes I lecture so fast that a student said that he dropped a pen, bent over to pick it up, and because of this, missed all of complex analysis. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the same as the movie strip And you take a disk and drawing the disk a bit sideways, okay? And then glue the boundaries together. So take a movie strip and the disk and identify them along the, their boundary circles. That is slightly better. That's a little easier to visualize than in the beginning, but it's still quite difficult to visualize. But do we get if I take a disk and along the circular boundary, I glue the boundary of the movie strip? You cannot do this in 3D, by the way. Difficult to visualize. But let's argue as follows. You know this disk that we have? I drew a cartoon picture there. Now I'm putting it horizontally. Suppose that I push up the edge a little bit and make it into this shape. Yeah. That's still topologically a disk. It's the same thing, homeomorphic to a disk. You can see that? And then just keep stretching this. And eventually, I get a shape like this, which is a sphere with one hole drilled out. That shape, <coughs> sphere minus a disk, is still homeomorphic to a disk. Hmm? Okay, so we can, in fact, visualize this as follows. Instead of this, let's take a sphere with a hole drilled out. Now, the boundary that you see is a circle, and you can try to, let's see, that, let's see how we can close this hole. The usual way to close this hole is to take a disk and put it on as a lid. That's possible pedantically because the boundary of the disk is a circle, so I can identify the circle with this circle. I can glue it along the circle. But let's imagine, I want you to exercise your imagination, that I take a movie strip and glue the circular boundary of the movie strip along the circular boundary. That's another way of closing this hole. Again, it's impossible to do in 3D, but you can do this. So, drill a hole on a sphere and put a lid on with a movie strip. This is what results if you make those identifications that we're discussing um, in the beginning. We will draw this result (coughs) 
as, well, there is no good way to draw it, so I shall take a very simple draw picture. I'm going to put a circle and then put something like this. So whenever you see this picture, it means drill out the hole, but put the lid back on, not with the ordinary lid, but with a movie strip. Glue back a movie strip on the hole, and the result is drawn like this. OK? And this resulting surface closed surface, mind you is called the real projective plane. There was, there still is, a beautiful area of geometry called projective geometry, which was organized in the 19th century. And the projective plane is where the projective geometry takes place. Real, because there's something called a complex projective plane, which I shall not um, discuss, we shall not discuss in this course. And the notation for this, which we shall use, is RP2. R because it's real, P stands for projective, and 2 because it's two-dimensional, it's a surface. Okay? Difficult to visualize, but that's what it is. We shall use this object a number of times later, and we'll eventually get used to this. Okay. We have discussed two operations, product and quotient, so to speak, multiplication and division. Now we'll discuss the third and most interesting of those operations, which we'll name surgery. It is a little like addition and subtraction. You cut and paste um, various manifolds. Here is the definition of how to cut and paste. Let's say that you have two manifolds. MFLD stands for manifold. M1, M2, of the same dimension. Let's call it small m. So the picture that I have in mind is, so I don't know what's happening to this manifold on this side, but here you get a manifold like this. So that's M1. Yeah, it might be very complicated. And another manifold. Again, I don't know what's, what's beyond there, but that's M2. OK. What we shall do, and these both have the same dimension M. What we shall, both, what we shall do is to drill out a hole from here. Remove this, this thing. When I say a hole, on a surface, dimension two surface, a hole is a two-dimensional ball, disk. On an m-dimensional manifold, a hole is an m-dimensional ball. By the way, if you have a one-dimensional curve, that's a one-dimensional manifold, if you make a hole, what do you get? You get a one ball, which is just an interval. Okay, so when I say a hole, I mean um, so uh, an emble. So I'm going to take away this kind of thing, and also I'm going to make another hole on the other side as well. So hands of God are taking away these things. So this is in the old note in the familiar notation a ball of dimension m, but I'm going to say that it's b1 because it was taken away from m1, and this is b2 because it was taken away from m2. So given those two manifolds, remove an m ball from each manifold. So drill a hole. Hmm? And then, I'm going to control here. Having removed those, how I go, how, what do those pictures look like? M1. M2. 
M2, identify the boundaries of the holes. And the resulting surface will, the cotton picture, look like this. And this is where they've been glued together. So that's, that was used to be M1, that used to be M2. Yeah. The result, it, in fact, it, it's a quotient space under this identification, is you know how to write this kind of thing. So M1, you take away a ball. So what remains, this thing, looks like, looks like this, in fact. And then on the other side, you have M2. You take away a ball from that. What it looks like is this. So you take this manifold, and then you take the quotient. You make the identification. And what is the identification? I have to identify this with this. That's what we mean by gluing these two things together. And formally, what it means is that you take the boundary of this manifold. This boundary is precisely this. And then, boundary of the other piece. This is that. And then glue them together. So you want to identify those two things. So this is what it is. And this is denoted always by M1. M2 with what in English is called a hash sign, and that's called the connected sum. Very strange name, connected sum, anyway, of M1 and M2. I have just defined the operation of surgery or connected sum. So if you have any two manifolds of the same dimension, you can take their connected sum, you can glue them together. But how do we mean glue them together? Precisely we mean you take a hole, you make a hole on one side, or you make the hole on the other side, and then put the holes together. And that's what happens in the connected sum. OK. OK. Let's see some examples of connected sum. Example 14. Oh, the sun is going in. That's bad. OK, question, what is the connected sum, the simplest case, of S1 and S1? Do you remember what S1 is? Yes? It's a, not a sphere, well, one-dimensional sphere, but the more common name is a circle. What do you think the connected sum of S1 and S1 is? Let's play the honest game, then. So that's one S1, that's another S1. What do we have to do? We have to take away a hole. What do we mean by hole? Well, we make a hole. We take away a one-dimensional ball, which is an integral. Yeah? So we took this away. We took this away. And then now we have to identify the boundaries of those holes. So what you are going to get? Well, you are going to get something like this. It's a curve. But that's, of course, homeomorphic to, to this. So the answer is that it's, again, S1. So connected sum of S1 and S1 is just S1. That's very easy. OK. This is quite easy, but it's a little surprising. We were perhaps expecting that we get something new by connecting some S1 and S1. So in a way, S1 in this case behaves like 0. Yeah, 0 plus 0 is 0. For no other number, do you have the property that that number plus that number is the same number? So here's an immediate, immediately interesting question. What plays the role of 0 for the operation of connected sum? Namely, what manifold, let's say Z, has the property 
that Z connected sum with some other manifold is again the same manifold. Yeah, we can ask that question. Hmm. Yeah. S1, but you see, S1 is used in the connected sum in one dimension. If you are connecting sum, say two, uh, so the two dimensional manifolds, you have to S2. If you do it in 3D, S3, and so on, good. You have a very good nose. Um, congratulations to Egypt. So the theorem. Uh, is that indeed the spheres play the role of zero with respect to the connected sum. So for every manifold M of dimension M, it is a case that the SM connected sum with M is again equal to, to M. And the proof is obvious, but it's nice to see how obvious it is. Here's how it goes. Let's say that you have this strange M, and it can be a complicated manifold, and you have a sphere. I'm going to draw two dimensional pictures. What do I do? I drill out the hole here, and then I drill out the hole here. Yeah. And then I glue those boundaries together. And what I'm going to get? Well, I'm going to get something like this. This was M, and this was the sphere. Yeah? But you see, this is ballooning out, but I can shrink it, and then I can gently push it down, and it's exactly the same thing as <coughs> the original. Did somebody sneeze? In that case, bless you. The original M. And that's what I used to do. If you are a little nervous, you can also argue as follows. You see, here I removed an M-dimensional ball. I'm going to glue back this sphere minus an M-dimensional ball, but the sphere that minus an M-dimensional hole is, in fact, also an M-dimensional hole. And you can see it in the following case in 2D. Imagine a sphere and think of it as consisting of north, northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. Removing a little bit of hole from the Arctic, Antarctica, excuse me, you get a sphere with a hole at the bottom. But that's the same thing as, if you like, just by making the hole larger and larger, just the northern hemisphere which is the same thing as if you flatten the northern hemisphere, just an equatorial disk. So, in fact, what you are gluing from left is just a disk. I removed a disk, I glued back the disk, the result doesn't change. So that's the zero element, end of proof. Okay. Please, however, be careful. Not everything is so trivial. A common mistake made by almost all beginners is in what you are removing in order to do the connected sum. You must remove a single ball from each side. So, please be careful that in connected sum, you remove a sing only one ball from each side. An example to show that it is important. Let's say that you want to consider the connect sum of a torus and a sphere. But suppose that you are careless, and instead of removing one hole and one hole here, I removed two holes here and two holes there. Okay? Two holes. And then I identify the holes. What are you going to get as a result? You can probably visualize this, right? What you're going to get is something like this.
And that is, of course, the same thing as a donut with two holes. You see, the result is not the same thing as the torus. It changed, although we seem to be adding a sphere, contrary to what we said, sphere does not play the role of zero. Aha, but that's because we did not do the connected sum. Connected sum takes only one hole away from each and glue. This is taking two from each. That's illegal. Okay? So this is not how you make S2 and T2 connected sum. This is not. If you take the honest connected sum of S2 and T2, you would get um, just the T2. In fact, this resulting surface is the connected sum of T2 and T2. You can probably see, right? If you have a torus on one side, a torus on another, another side, and you do the connected sum, you get this. Okay. So it's not the same thing. However, this is a good opportunity to introduce a whole set of new, a whole class of new manifolds, new surfaces. Definition 16. So each time we connect some with a new copy of T2, you get more and more Torah, you get more and more of those um, holes, you get more and more copies of Tadashi to Kieda, if you like. And we shall give it a name. This sigma sub G is by definition a lot of multiple copies, G copies of torus connected sum. Okay. And this thing is called, now the name is not felicitously chosen, but we shall call it the Riemann surface. Because in a certain context in mathematics, very important concept, the con context of algebraic geometry, these things are the Riemann surfaces of genus G. Have you ever heard the word genus? Well, okay. Genus is a word of Latin origin. The plural is genera. In French, it's genre. It means kind or species, and that's why we use the word genus. Just a random word for this occasion, genus G. And the picture is much easier to draw. You have a copy of T2, another copy of T2, and then you just keep adding under connect sum and copy of T2. So it looks like this. As a matter of convention, we should like to decide what sigma of zero is. What happens if we don't have any copy? Well, one school of thought might say it's the empty set. We have nothing. But it's more um, practical, it turns out, to decide that it is S2, two-dimensional sphere. And also note a much more natural convention that, or the result that sigma one, if you have only one copy, it is just equal to T2 itself. Okay. A little later today, or maybe tomorrow, it will be useful to have an alternative picture of sigma g, Riemann surface of genus g. Here is the alternative picture. Instead of having all those donuts strung next to each other, we are going to imagine that we have a big sphere. You might object, that's not a sphere. It looks like an ellipsoid, but that's OK. We are doing topology. It's all soft. And then we are going to attach what the professionals call handles. Now, I hope that you can, you're seeing the picture that I'm seeing. Because this picture, a little abstract, is not completely obvious to everyone. So this is supposed to represent 
another picture for sigma g is that you have those g what we call handles attached on a sphere. Hmm? 